Today is December uh, 13th, 2023. This is our last session in this eight ser part series, uh, the IPRO Echo, When the Pain Won't Stop, Whole Person Care Addressing Chronic Pain. And um, we're really excited about today's conversation. Well, actually, we're excited about every presentation, but the and today we get to be excited about this one. So we have with us, um, I'll introduce in a second, uh, Dr. Jeff Gooden, who is going to talk about the future of analgesics. And we have also returning uh, uh, Dr. Orlando Wright, who is also going to talk about uh, a, a very important topic, which is integrative thinking about patient care. So welcome to everyone. Um, let's see, I've lost my slides. On the next slide, uh, we have technical issues. If you have any, just email um, Lynn Smith or uh, drop her a note in the chat and she will be able to help you. On the next slide. So this uh, series is sponsored by the IPRO Quinn QIO. As uh, you all have heard me say before, um, the IPRO Quinn QIO is one of 12 regional CMS funded Quinn QIOs nationally. On that slide, you'll see the states that we are working with. And we are partnered with um, two other QIOs, uh, Health Centric Advisors and Clarent, which is well represented by TOSIN on our committee here. And uh, we are working together to improve the um, care and outcome and safety of about 20% of the nation's Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries. So we're, we're, we like our work a lot. On the next slide, uh, this is where we are working. This is the whole range of work that we work on. We uh, This series is really focused on reducing opioid-related adverse drug events. Um, and our primary focus is uh, to use opioids wisely. And um, we're looking at the care of people with chronic pain from a biopsychosocial perspective. Next slide, please. So our agenda today is um, that this, my talking will end in a minute. Um, and then uh, Dr. Gooden is going to talk about the future of analgesics and we'll follow that with uh, five minutes of Q and A with him. We decided to flip uh, the order today uh, just to accommodate the case conversation. And so then um, Orlando will talk about integrative thinking about patient care for 15, or for 15 minutes followed by five minutes of questions and answers. And then what we wanna do, so I'm gonna tell you, we wanna talk about what does the future of healthcare look like for people who are living with chronic pain? Um, and this whole series is the biopsychosocial perspective of these people. And so um, we want to make sure that we are um, thinking big about that. Our learning objectives for today, um, are really looking at basic pain physiology and pharmacology, increase, increasing our knowledge of uh, currently approved analgesics and introduction of um, new drug and non-drug analgesics in development. That's exciting. And then um, we'll explore considerations of the whole person going well beyond a diagnosis. Next slide, please. So some um, echo etiquette. Uh, includes my screen. I have all these things popping up all of a sudden. Um, uh, please, uh, no PHI. That's the really the most important thing. We really do invite you to turn on your cameras if you're able, um, so that we have a sense of who's here and a really a nice sense of community with one another. Please feel free to raise your hand if you would like to speak. You will. That's certainly acceptable. Or um, put comments in the chat. All all good ways to engage with us. Next slide. Um, I think I've covered this. Uh, for people who are looking for CEs, uh, you must complete the evaluation form. You must complete the sign-in sheet. Tosin is working on the link in the chat. And then at the end, we'll give you an evaluation form. We get the summary of those evaluations once a month. So the evaluations, we just got the evaluation summaries from the first session back in October. And um, so really great positive uh, input. We appreciate it. And also some great ideas for the future. And we are working on incorporating those suggestions into, um, into January sessions. So 
thank you very much for that. Next slide. Um, I've already said this. Uh, next slide. Well, I do want to say one thing about the CEs. You will get the CEs. You'll get your link to your CEs right in your email. We don't have access to that. So please flag that email, print it, whatever you need to do to keep it. So here are our presenters for today. Um, Dr. Gooden is a uh, board certified in anesthesiology, pain management, addiction medicine, hospice and palliative care. And he's also interestingly a medical acupuncturist. So he's kind of dedicated to really thinking about the whole patient and the body um, as uh, not just one, one way to think about it, I guess. Um, he's also a professor at the University of Miami, Miller School of Medicine, Department of Anesthesiology, uh, perioperative medicine and pain management. Very busy man. Um, and I will also say that uh, Dan Berlin, who is usually here, is away this week. And that is um, why we have the lucky fortune of having Dr. Gooden with us. And then Orlando is back and uh, he is a behavioral scientist with a master's of social work from the University of Connecticut and a PhD uh, in behavioral science from Capella University. More than 20 years of experience in clinical service delivery management, behavioral health systems and partnership development. So lots, lots of knowledge and expertise. Uh, Orlando has also written a book, two books, right Orlando? two books. So uh, you could also look that up. Uh, Tosin is here. She's a pharmacist who works on our team. Uh, Rosie, uh, Janice is not here. She's away. I believe Rosie is away today too. Carolyn is away today, but I'm here. So anyways, that's who, that's who we have here. Next slide. So disclosures. Uh, this is our disclosure statement. Um, all all potential uh, conflicts of interest have been mitigated and um, no conflicts of interest have been found uh, for today's presentation. So thank you for that. Next slide. So without any further ado, Dr. Gooden, it's all yours. And you could thank just direct Lynn to move the slide as, as you need. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn, for having me. And uh, and welcome to all of you joining today. So I've been given the very difficult task of 15 minutes of, uh, of, a, of, a, of, of content for something that I could probably talk about for a week straight, right? What's on the development for, what's on the horizon for, for analgesics? I've been in the space for 25 years or longer. And as you'll hear in a minute, I'm involved with uh, research. I have an NIH grant studying a new analgesic molecule. I'll tell you a little bit about, but I'll give you an idea of the landscape of pain medicine. Lynn, next slide, please. Uh, we went over the objectives. Next slide. I'm going to try to keep us moving at a good pace. And this is an animated slide, Lynn. So if you can click two or three times, I'll tell you when to stop. Keep going. One or two more. That's good. Right there is good. So hopefully you all recognize at this point in your lives that most of the injuries that you have that cause pain go away, whether it's hours, days, weeks, or, or months. They're meant to heal on their own. The literature defines chronic pain as pain that lasts longer than it should or anything longer than three months is about the roundabout time frame that we agree on. And unfortunately, for a small subset of patients, I'm talking about two, three, four percent, they never get back to normal. There's always some sensitivity, hyperactivity, some type of chronic pain. We've called that central sensitization. The anesthesiologists have coined this phrase spinal cord windup, where your, your nervous system literally gets so wound up or irritated that it creates pain signals on its own. Next slide. Um, this is a slide that I lecture, I use for the students to give them an idea of what are the pain pathways. And we have pathways that go from the skin all the way up to the brain and pathways that come down from the brain through the spinal cord back to the periphery. Obviously you learned back in elementary or junior high, you put your finger on the hot stove, message goes up to your brain, your brain says, hey, that's pretty hot, take your hand off and you pull your, pull your hand back. So I used to think of the pain signal as an electrical message, like we had electricity running through our bodies because you know you hit your funny bone and that's what it feels like, but it really is a very chemically modulated message. And because it's chemically modulated, we can interrupt those chemicals. And the way we do that is with certain pharmacological agents. And you see them here on the screen. NSAIDs, topical analgesics, things like gabapentin medicine, steroids, cannabinoids, uh, yes, there is a medicine inside the, uh, the you know, the, the, the THC uh, plant or, or molecules. Um, and you see opioids are listed here in a, in a number of the boxes. It turns out that opioids are these kind of broad spectrum analgesics that work all throughout 
the nervous system. So when we see a patient currently, we go through this kind of paradigm in our head with what can I use from each one of these boxes to block the patient's pain? Next slide. Sorry, then next slide. Um, the other thing that I think you're going to see that I won't talk much about, but it's equally exciting, is this whole concept of personalized medicine. You know, now, if you go to the oncologist or uh, the hematologist or even the psychiatrist and some cardiologists, they will send a genetic sample, a DNA sample to the lab to determine how you may or may not metabolize certain medicines based on your genetics, right? This is called personalized medicine, choosing the right drug that's for you. And believe it or not, we're just at the start of being able to do that for pain medicines as well. The first level is figuring out which enzymes you have in your body that are able to metabolize drugs, right? Some drugs need to be broken down into their active substances. Uh, some drugs might hang around too long and cause toxicity. So we need the right uh, ability to metabolize drugs. And we can currently today test people from what we call a pharmacogenetic perspective. And rest assured, the next time I talk to you guys is going to be about the future of personalizing pain medicine using things like pharmacogenetics. Next slide. Okay, so why is pain so difficult to treat? If you think about this chemical or electrical signaling cascade that I talked about, just have a look at the screen. These are just some of the channels that are involved. So it's, pain is very difficult to treat because we don't have any one drug or one therapy that blocks all of these signaling cascades. So it's very difficult. I call these ricochet pain pathways. Let's go to the next slide. When we think about what we do have to use right, right now in today's day and age, we have complementary and non-pharmacological therapies, physical therapy, acupuncture, chiropractics, behavioral modalities. We have Tylenol or acetaminophen and NSAIDs. We have opioids if pain is really severe and refractory. And I write here traditional and ADF. Some of you may not have heard about ADF opioids. It stands for abuse deterrent formulations. So right now, the pharmaceutical industry is really aggressively trying to find molecules that work like opioids, but have no abuse potential, no respiratory depression, no death associated with them. I'll introduce you to one or two of those before the end of the talk. We use topical analgesics. We use a variety of antidepressants and anti-seizure medicines to try to stop the signaling. And when things are real bad, you go see an interventional pain doc like myself, and you might get a spinal, an epidural, a nerve block, an implantable spinal stimulator, an implantable pain pump. So there are some technologies that are um, gaining in popularity and new technologies coming out each and every year. I did not include too many of the newer implantable devices again. We could talk the whole day on this topic. Next slide, or at least the next box. Here's a bad joke that got us into a little trouble with the opioids. Look, you got to stop thinking that one little pill is going to solve all your problems. You need to take at least four little pills twice a day, right? So we got into the habit of escalating medications, and it wasn't the best idea for many of the patients that we treat. Lynn, next slide, please. All right. Now, I want you to know that the medicines that we use to treat pain and the medicines that are investigational, the future of analgesics, most all of them work through trying to block what we call depolarization or cell firing or excitability of the nerves. And they do that by blocking various channels in the nerves and in the spinal cord. So you've heard of sodium channel blockers, right? Uh, drugs like lidocaine and local anesthetics work by blocking the sodium channel. You've heard of calcium channel blockers, mostly in the hypertension space, but also in the, in the pain space. Potassium, if you influx the cell with potassium, it doesn't fire anymore. You've heard about you know, issues related uh, to potassium. And it turns out that this is the way capsaicin works, right? This is the way menthol works. If you buy the Tiger Bomb or, or Icy Hot in the, in the pharmacy, they block certain ion channels in the nervous system. And believe it or not, this is how opioids work as well. Most people think about opioids as these bad drugs that just kill people. No, they work very similar to the way all of the other pain medicines work. They try to stop the firing of the pain nerves. That's why we're still using opioids, and that's why I'm going to show you some that are in development. Next slide. All right. All of this 
lay press news that opioids don't work and there's no long-term data, I thought you guys should just have an idea where that comes from. What the FDA said is, look, there's no evidence that opioids work in long-term clinical studies for more than a year. But I'll tell you why that's so unfair. Because the, the baseline that FDA requires for any pharmaceutical class, psychiatry, cardiology, uh, wh whatever, you know, is a three-month clinical trial. So no drugs have one year, especially pain drugs. Imagine asking a patient to go on a placebo for a year for, a, for something as painful as a, a chronic pain syndrome. So FDA, in a sense, is right that we don't have any long-term greater than one-year data. But when you look at the data that they ask for, which is three-month data, these are studies from 10 or 15 of the long-acting opioids that we use in clinical practice. Most of them do what they're supposed to do. They lower pain scores in patients with a variety of chronic pain syndromes. Again, this is why we still use opioids. You guys hear a lot of the bad things in the lay press. You've even seen some data from veterans hospitals and things that opioids are no better than Tylenol or, or, or NSAIDs. For mild to moderate pain, that's true. But rest assured, if somebody comes into the ER screaming with pain or with a kidney stone or cancer or exacerbation, Tylenol and NSAIDs are not going to cut it. We need to have something as strong as opioids for that type of pain. Next slide. All right. Click through a couple times here, Lynn, and I'll just review for the crowd to remind you one or two more clicks, one more click. Try one more and see what happens. All right, one more. To remind you, there are different types of medicines that we use. Most of them are pure mu receptor opioid agonists, like morphine, oxycodone, hydrocodone, fentanyl, methadone, et cetera. Most of you are familiar with naloxone. Lynn mentioned it before, part of the, uh, the program for helping to save lives related to opioids. There are other opioid antagonists. Some of you know about naltrexone, and some of you have kept up with the news, saw a few months back a new one called nalmaphene was introduced. There's a weird group of opioids that work a little bit like an agonist and a little bit like an antagonist. And they play a little bit of a role in medicine, not too much in chronic pain. Some of you may have heard of nubane or nalbuphene. There's a very useful molecule, which believe it or not, binds to the opioid receptor, activates the receptor, and very binds very tightly, but it's not as potent or as strong as the other was like morphine or oxycodone. And most of you have heard about that drug also. It's called buprenorphine. It's why we use it in opioid use disorder treatment. It's why we use it in chronic pain. It binds very tightly to the opioid receptor. It activates the opioid receptor, but it reaches a ceiling dose of plateau, and it has a safety margin there. And then there's opioid-like molecules. Some of you may have heard about tramadol, tapentadol, and one I'll introduce to you in a moment called sebronopadol. Next slide. Okay, so you hear my kind of propensity to mention the word opioids. There, there's a lot of research going on on how can we find the holy grail of an opioid or, or a molecule like it that would treat severe pain without the baggage, without the side effect profile associated with, with opioids. So there's the $64,000 question for those of you old enough to, uh, to remember that, that show. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. We can probably create safer opioid-like molecules. All right, next slide. Hopefully you guys are okay with the pace. I'm going to try to get through. There are different types of opioid receptors. We have mu, delta, kappa, and a recently discovered one which they called opioid receptor-like, ORL1, as a matter of fact, for a while, but it's now been renamed nociceptin. And if you look in development, without talking a lot about each one of these, I'll mention one or two, there are pharmaceutical companies and academic centers right now that are working on agonists to bind to each one of these receptors, and the delta, kappa, and NOP receptors don't have the respiratory depression or some of the toxicities that we see associated with mu. Next slide. Okay, so the analgesic future is bright. If we think about the picture I showed you earlier, there are medications in development that block the pain signal out in the periphery. There are medications that block the pain signal at the spinal cord. There are electrical therapy, spinal cord stimulation that block the pain signal at the spinal cord. And believe it or not, right now we're using things for using these stimulation therapies for things like 
painful diabetic neuropathy, post-herpetic neuralgia, things we usually thought about as neuropathic-like pain syndromes, and they respond to spinal cord stimulation. And at the bottom, I found this, this image of just what is in development from centrally acting analgesic medications, and I'll share with you a couple of those now. Next slide. All right. There, uh, for the last 10 or 20 years, the literature has shown that when you bind to a receptor, not only is there a primary effect, some proteins uncouple, but there are downstream effects that happen at the, at the ion channels. And some brilliant scientists figured out, hey, when it comes to the opioid receptor, you know, there's some good stuff that happens and there's some bad stuff that happens. Can we create a ligand, a medicine, that's biased to only the good stuff and not the bad stuff? So what do they call it? Biased ligands. And it turns out we have one already on the market called oloceridine, approved for postoperative pain. And we have a number in development. Now, before the call, Lynn and I, or the group was chatting about artificial intelligence, believe it or not, the scientists are using AI to build scaffolds of chemical structures of molecules. And it, the computer is able to evaluate millions and millions and millions of chemical structures to figure out which one would be the most lipid soluble, which one would be rapid acting, which one would not meet toxicity profiles. It's really amazing. Technology is just exploding in all areas, including in medicine. And here's an example of a new medicine that literally biases towards the good things that happen with opioids and not the bad thing. Next slide. All right, here's um, a drug that I'm actually working on, fully funded by the NIH. I mentioned before there are different opioid receptors. Morphine and oxycodone and fentanyl and methadone bind to the mu opioid receptor. That also activates your endorphins for those of you that are runners or skydivers or gamblers or, you know, you get that endorphin rush. Well, it turns out we have another chemical like endorphin called enkephalin, and it's controlled by the delta opioid receptor. And delta doesn't have any significant respiratory depression or some of the baggage with, with opioids. So right now we just finished our animal studies, never been in humans before, this really novel formulation of enkephalin. It's an intranasal spray. It goes through the olfactory tract. You have a, a cranial nerve in the top of your nose and it gives you easy access to the brain. It's the shortest distance between the outside of the body and inside of the brain. Hopefully in 10 years or so, I'll be back talking to you about this, this medication if it makes it across the finish line. Next slide. Sebronopadol, I mentioned before, this is a company uh, recently took this molecule over from a European company. They're here in the U.S. This is a molecule that binds a little bit to the mu opioid receptor, but also to that fourth type of opioid receptor I mentioned before, NOP. And it does something really, really neat. It gives you a little bit of opioid-like effects. And it gives you a little bit of anti-opioid-like effects. And what they found is a drug that treats pain, has a ceiling effect has zero to no respiratory depression, has no withdrawal when you stop it immediately, and works in multiple pain models like cancer pain, neuropathic pain, postoperative pain, musculoskeletal pain. So here's a drug that's still in investigation, but you may be hearing about in the nearer future because I think they're doing phase three, phase three trials. A very cool mechanism of action. Next slide. All right, the last thing I'll talk about before we open the floor for Q&A is something I mentioned earlier abuse deterrent opioids. Clearly, prescription opioids contributed to the problem that we had with the opioid epidemic. Was it the cause of it? Probably not. We've had a drug and heroin abuse problem for a long time. Uh, the, you know, clandestine uh, labs and the and the, and the terror organizations figured out that they could easily get fentanyl across our borders, the Chinese and the Mexicans. I mean, they've, they've been flooding our streets with fentanyl. So yes, prescription pharmaceuticals played a role in the start, but this was bound to happen sooner or later. Um, it turns out that the pharmaceutical companies have successfully now been able to change the formulation of an opioid. So you can't just crush it with a hammer or a spoon or a mortar and pestle. They made it so that if you, it's very difficult to crush first off. And even if you do crush it, it crushes to big sized particles like rocks that people don't want to snort or, or use intranasally. And if you try to mix it with liquid, it turns into like a goopy gel that doesn't go into a syringe and you can't inject it. Let's go to the next slide. There are a number of these agents here. You could look at the screen. Only a few of them have made it. It's been a very tough road for these abuse deterrent opioids. There's one immediate release oxycodone abuse deterrent and there's three extended released 
uh, opioids that have abuse deterrence now. And I want to share with you one more really neat thing. Let's go to the next slide. I'm working with a company in California, also fully funded by grants, by NIH grants, that I think has the most novel and potentially successful uh, abuse deterrent formulation out there. So guess what they did? There's, it's a two-step process. And without going too, too detailed, they figured out a way, first off, to make the opioid into a pro-drug. What that means, it's not converted to the actual drug until it's in your GI tract. So if you smoke it or snort it or inject it, it doesn't work. It has to go into the GI tract. So that's the first step. The second step is they put into the pill something that stops the metabolism the more you take. So there's a little bit in one pill that has no effect, but if you take five, six, 10, 20 pills, you inhibit the metabolism of this drug. So what you see in the graph here is if you don't have overdose protection, the top green line, the more you give, the more you get. The more you take, the more you get. That's linear pharmacokinetics. But look at the bottom line. You get one tablet, two tablets, three tablets, you're on the rise. Anything more, you plateau off. Anything more, that starts to come down. So to me, this is the uh, future of abuse deterrent formulations. This is overdose protection. You have to take it by mouth, and the more you take, the less you get. Uh, really ingenious. Next slide, Lynn. I think we're pretty much at the end of our of our slides, let's see. Uh, okay, I'll tell you what you see on the news. If you watch CNBC or any of the science shows, a number of companies, uh, including uh, I think Vertex and, and one other working on sodium channel blockers. These have been in clinical trials for more than 25 years. I remember seeing them as a medical student and they're coming closer. So new sodium channel blockers on the horizon. Next slide. Uh, so, Thank you for letting me squeeze a lot into a little bit of time. Again, that otherwise would have been at least an hour. I have a whole nother list of medicines that we didn't even talk about, but rest assured, we're making great strides in finding new and novel pain medicines, great strides in improving the technology of spinal cord stimulators, great strides in improving the technology of implantable pain delivery of medication delivery devices. But we still have a long way to go. We don't have great drugs. We have to come up with better medicines for the treatment of pain. Lynn, I'm good for quick Q and A. Wow, that slide. was that was whirlwind. Thank you so much. So, uh, questions for Dr. Gooden, uh, comments. Uh, one comment in the chat uh, that sent to me is, "It's a great innovation for mental health SUD patients." Yes, yes, yes absolutely, yes. absolutely. And 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 Lynn, the technologies that I talked about are going to be applied towards. Uh, drugs for psychiatric and psychotropic reasons as well. Intranasal sprays to get the drug to the brain, the brain quickly. So I, what I didn't, what I didn't mention is the drug that we're studying in Kefalin, this endorphin like molecule is actually a better stress modulator than it is a pain drug. But the grant that we got was for the study of pain. Believe it or not, I can't wait till the next step. Once we have a little bit of funding for it is to look at it in PTSD, suicide. We don't have a suicide drug right now, right? If somebody comes in, we're using the same antipsychotics we used 30 years ago. Uh, so I think there's a lot of promise and this will certainly be great for the, for the SUD and the, and the mental health population as well. Quick question. How are you redefining neuropathic pain to clinicians? Yeah. So, you know, I'm not sure it's being redefined. Some of the uh, pain societies have redefined our chronic pain definitions, but neuropathic pain, we teach the students all the time, is a different bird, a different animal than nociceptive kind of pain. You have to hear the buzzwords for neuropathic pain, burning, tingling, shock-like, ant crawling, ants crawling on me, electricity sensation. That's neuropathic pain. And as you know, it responds differently than bone, muscle, and joint pain or visceral pain. So that's where we think about our amitriptyline, our antidepressants, our anticonvulsants, our topical local anesthetic uh, uh, medications. Um, and then the, the device companies are doing a great job educating. As a matter of fact, I just met this morning with the uh, company that makes the capsaicin patch, the high-dose capsaicin patch. And not only do they have approval for post-herpetic neuralgia, a terrible neuropathic syndrome. They have approval for painful diabetic neuropathy, and they're also studying other neuropathic uh, pain indications. So again, more things on the horizon, obviously. Um, if I could clarify, I think what I meant was, uh, from what you're saying, um, and my name is Nadia Dimitrov. I'm both a clinician and a, an academic, but 
um, teaching students about um, examining the patient for pain, yes, all those things have applied, and that traditionally is how we use, uh, you know, the historical references, and also we use the um, the uh, what do you call it? the Sam Weinstein monofilament and things like that regarding yeah. the physical examination. But in what you were saying related to the opioid receptor ligand or the nociception, I mean that traditionally is nociception is related not related necessarily to neuropathic pain, but to nociceptive pain, which is more, um, I think, organ and um, um, soft and tissue. skeletal muscle, yeah, and skeletal, skeletal muscle and those you know, kind of things, yeah, muscle. So it's it seems as though from what you're saying that because of these newly discovered, if you will, receptors or ligands, that the very notion of neuropathic is really not so much a classic definition anymore, but it really is a mixed um, picture because you're using things like encephalines. And by the way, ketamine has been used for PTSD for a while. As, sure, as you yeah. Know. So yeah, not enough. It's a very astute, uh, very astute, uh, you know, uh, recognition. I'll tell you when you look at some of the new data in osteoarthritis, they're showing that OA patients have neuropathic-like pains around their joints, right? Well, so, they do, definitely so, right, because of the right. joint receptors. Of course, yeah. So, so you're right. It's becoming a little bit cloudy doing the differentiation between pure neuropathic and pure nociceptive. So, most of what we see is indeed is indeed mixed pain. If there's one thing we know, neuropathic pain does not respond to NSAIDs, right? Which is why we go to right. the adjuvant analgesics. And I was looking on my desk, it must be in my other lab coat. I'll tell you the most important tool that I've used in my 30 years is my tuning fork. And I don't use it to test hearing. I use it because it's a cold piece of metal. And if you remember, pain and temperature travel in the same right. nerve fiber right. pathways. So when I teach my students, I'm like, look, if you don't want to carry a reflex hammer, I understand it. You need a way to assess for sensation. You can kind of use your hands to test reflexes. I mean, I carry one, of course. Uh, but but I think sensory examination to students is something I teach them. And it's, to me, a critical differential between nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain. Most patients with neuropathic pain either have sensory deficits or hyperalgesia, heightened response to uh, to pain. Well, um, and along the same lines, then, because it is a mixed pain picture, um, probably the topical mixtures or compounds that have been put together in the last 20 or 30 years um, have been very effectively used for patients who have neuropathic pain because it, they actually use the compounds like gabapentin and they put it into a topical form, form with other uh, medications or ingredients, if you will, like lidocaine and other things and have effectively um, addressed that neuropathic pain picture. I totally agree with to compounds, compounding. To totally agree. Wish I had time to add some of that, some of that data in. It's a little controversial as to whether or not topical, topically applied centrally acting agents have the benefit. But because they usually mix so many things into one cream, ketoprofen, gabapentin, amitriptyline, it's hard to know which of those agents is working. But there is some data, and perhaps next time I could address it. But also there's the placebo effect. Of course. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you. Uh, Anne, I didn't know if you had any questions. No, I don't have any questions. I thought this was really interesting and it was all new. And oftentimes, you know, you, you go to continuing education events and you hear the same things that you kind of knew. Maybe you learned a few things that were new. This was really super fresh. So I really appreciate it. And um, and I love pharmacology, so it was really uh, fun to think about that. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Godin. Um, oh, sure. if, if anyone has other questions that you think of, um, please feel for, free to put them in the chat and we can circle back. Orlando, I'm going to turn over to you now, and then we will do the case conversation about future care for people with uh, chronic pain um, after that. Uh, next slide, next slide, I think it's a couple slides down. Next slide. There we go. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, based on where you might be. Um, uh, as mentioned earlier, Orlando Wright, I'm with the School of Medicine, in particular, the Department of uh, Research and Treatment uh, for Addiction. We're based out of Baltimore. Uh, next slide. 
Next slide. Just to operationalize this for folks, we are an integrated uh, center. And so there are several programs under the same banner. It is an active research center as well as treatment uh, for persons with uh, addictions. The areas that I want to draw your attention to here is uh, there are a couple metrics that we're looking at. It's called the upper payment limit metrics and often comes down through the CMS uh, grants in the way that that's structured through the University of Maryland. Uh, folks may be familiar with some of these already. We've seen quite a bit of activity around these types of programs. But what I want to talk with you about today is about the several areas of integration, some of the challenges, and also some of the exciting things that we're doing on the ground in terms of primary care, uh, substance use disorder treatment, and also looking at social determinants of health. And so the first area there is the avoidable ED visits, some of our care coordination that will be going into that. Preventable admissions, really about preventable admissions for folks who don't need to go into an inpatient setting and could be treated uh, safely in outpatient settings or other um, alternative uh, environments. And then last but not least, SDOH or social determinants of health. I talk a bit about some of the work that we have uh, that's ongoing in this space. Next slide, please. So as we think about how we put it to practice, there are several areas that come together. And uh, folks may have heard may have heard of integrated uh, approaches to providing medications for substance use disorder and also treatment coupled with SDOH. But I think we have a pretty interesting practice around how we do this. The first program you see there is called ADAP. Folks may be familiar with intensive outpatient uh, programs or outpatient programs that's on ADAP uh, facility within the same thing. We also have an opiate treatment program. Uh, there's a methadone uh, side of things. As Dr. Gooden mentioned earlier, uh, there are some positive use of um, medications um, and certainly controversial. But the fact of the matter is the methadone continues to be one of the uh, approved medications for treating opiate use disorders. And then also, last but not least there, we have uh, the uh, HARP program, which is what I oversee, the health and recovery practice. And this is the primary care practice for persons with substance use disorder. So we're doing a number of different integration in terms of those who have hepatitis C, HIV, uh, needs for uh, normal monitoring of chronic conditions. And then last but not least, I think this is a really important part to mention, is a drop-in center where folks can have their social determinants of health be addressed with some of our community health workers and also peers uh, that facilitate connection uh, with the persons who are coming into the center. Uh, just to paint a picture for you, if you walk in downstairs, folks have the opioid treatment program. Upstairs, where you'll find the ADAP program, uh, and heart. And let me not uh, forget, we do have a component of this for those who are deaf and hard to hear, which is pretty unique. Serve about 35 patients in that particular program uh, with individuals who are actually providing uh, sign language that is curtailed to that population. The outcomes, as I mentioned, uh, we, we're now hoping to integrate some of our service in our EPIC uh, EHR. And one of the big things we're looking for is screening for individuals with several areas of need. Next slide. So how we operationalize identification of social determinants of health is through a screening process. And we're looking at five key areas, housing, food, transportation, financial security, intimate partner violence, and tobacco use uh, disorder. The reason why this dovetails, I think, to a lot of the preclinical pieces that were mentioned is we have several areas of need 
And we really don't know it unless we have folks who are either peers or CHW stands for community health workers who are interfacing with the individuals in this program. And then from there, once we've identified the need, we want to be able to connect them into those services. So they can walk into our drop-in center and we may recognize that uh, and or may identify that they require some type of treatment. And so as a result, we'll um, refer them to our OTP or our patient programs. But most importantly, a lot of our folks, especially in the, wall, in the West Baltimore area, is in need of housing, uh, food, and other financial security items. And so we try to facilitate that through our community health workers and then start to establish community linkage. As it stands, we're going to eventually design a study around uh, the linkage to the programs. What we do know is about 30% of our folks actually get the care that they need. And we are certainly aware of uh, how important social determinants of health is in terms of sustainability, in terms of treatment, uh, medications for substance uh, use disorders, and also uh, maintaining a long-term adherence to the services that they uh, may need. Next slide. The other piece that is, is important within our HARP program, we have uh, social workers and uh, nursing who are doing community uh, care coordination. Uh, obviously for our nurses, we're looking at collaboration with EPA. So a number of our folks provide that collaboration with EPA and ensure that uh, those with, uh, there are certainly folks who are gonna show up that have medical needs. And we want to ensure that as they're showing up with their medical needs, there are some folks who do need to receive care through the hospital. So it's not one size fit all. So we wanna make sure that the scope of practice for some of our nurses on the ground, and then also the social worker can coordinate and collaborate with that particular patient. Uh, we are using data. Folks who are outside of Maryland may not be familiar with CRISP, but we'll call it HIE, or Health Information Exchange. Uh, we are using that data to help us look at folks rise in risk, and then also individuals who have uh, pretty high utilization may need coordination of care. That looks very different from those who may have a rise. It is uh, an essential piece to partner with our EDs. And as it stands, University of Maryland has the trauma center, which is not too far from us, and our treatment program. So in terms of proximity, it does help to be close. And so our nurses can go over uh, to the emergency room and coordinate with folks who are there or establish clients and patients of us, of ours. Uh, the other piece is as we look at outcomes, we're looking to be able to serve more of the population of folks with a substance use disorder who may not also be connected with a primary care doctor. We're also looking at some of our, what we call U, uh, UPL metrics, meaning that we want to uh, increase the touch base of folks who need the care. Some of our client population, they're certainly homeless. Uh, folks are actively using substances, so we try to integrate harm reduction principles into our practice to make sure that folks know that there's no wrong door in terms of the services uh, that they could be provided. The drop-in center is really an avenue for it, is that folks come in and um, uh, you know, simple things like having a place to use a computer and then also talk to a peer about the types of services that are available. We're hoping to increase our visibility in the community and make sure folks know that we're there and there are several types of entry into uh, services they can receive. Next slide. Okay. The preventable admissions, uh, sometimes there are folks who are, uh, would potentially go into inpatient. And so our care coordination uh, piece that I mentioned is really about as we identify individuals with a particular illness that we can use the CRISP data for. And uh, that CRISP data comes through our health information exchange. 
we are identifying the actual uh, medical condition or uh, psychiatric condition. So individuals who are in need of a particular level of care often may go to the ED because that's what they know. They can get immediate access. Well, our center is, uh, it's not 24 seven, so we haven't fixed that piece, but our center is really about being able to have uh, open access to be able to see a primary care doctor. So there are dedicated doctors in our primary care center who they can walk in and see and or quickly schedule. And the idea there is that we then um, can treat wounds in our drop-in center. We have folks who can do a prescription. We have a pharmacy, a relationship with a pharmacy. Uh, we were talking with Dr. David earlier about our 340B program that helps to reinstate uh, medications that are paid for and gives us a reimbursement to further invest in our programs. And so there are some pieces of what we do that persons might show up into the ED that we can actually take care of in our outpatient setting. And the benefit there is that if wounds can be addressed or other types of uh, somatic pain uh, management can be addressed, we have the capacity of staffing to be able to uh, do that. Uh, next slide. I want folks to, to know that, let me just uh, recap for you, but I want you to know that within this one place, we have done something that I think we don't see often. Folks may be familiar with certified community behavioral health clinics operating within this space, but what we're doing is we're offering primary care, opiate treatment programs with counselors. We're also having a drop-in center to address social determinants of health and case management. And what's unique about it is some of our MDs are, are very interested in managing uh, some of our somatic pain uh, concerns that folks come into our center with. And they're doing that on an ongoing basis. We see about 475 patients. We have capacity for about 700. We're also building out capacity for our drop-in center to do much more care coordination and connection and linkage to community-based programs. I try to run through that pretty quickly, but uh, hopefully I've given folks a overview of some of the on-the-ground services that we're providing. And then the other piece that I should not forget is uh, we have several research products that are underway. Uh, some of those are in the social determinants of health space. Others are taking a look at trauma-informed care or trauma-responsive care and how we can provide um, comprehensive and integrated uh, care for the, the population that we serve. It is for those with a substance use disorder uh, because those are some of the hardest to treat. And it's an interesting area. Uh, I'll take any questions from folks in the chat that may have questions. It's heartwarming to hear about a program that's really striving to be holistic and to meet people where they are in the neighborhood where they are and so on. It's uh, sometimes we forget if we don't have that in our community, we forget that that's a possibility. So I'm wondering, um, yeah, amazing. I was just saying it's amazing, right? I mean, it's inspiring. And I guess it makes me wonder, like, where do you start if you you have nothing or you have a, a patchwork of disconnected potential, let's say. Well, how, how, where do you start? The, the, so this is under the leadership of uh, Dr. Eric Weintraub uh, and Dr. Amoroso. Dr. Amoroso, they're giants in this space, um, very interesting model. And they started looking at, um, I believe in Kenya, uh, there were no systems in place in that country, and they got a grant to look at persons with substance use disorders and also those who had co-occurring uh, comorbidities, in particular those with HIV. So that's where they started, grant-funded program. And the way ARP came about was they had in existence the opiate treatment program, but we recognized that there were individuals coming in with medical needs that just weren't being addressed. And so they secure initial grant funding to provide 
accent. So a lot of the docs who come in through your School of Medicine um, either provide primary care or psychiatry services. And so the start was really about thinking about the ideas that has been shared about integrative care over the last several years and then starting to look at how we can model this. I, so it does offer some challenges. One of the challenges I was meeting with Dr. Amorosa yesterday is thinking about how we can have peer coordination with patients. And there are opportunities to do that. And that, you know, folks may be familiar with some of the peer coordination through primary care or the structure, but it's further complicated based on how we're set. And then also, how do we get reimbursement for sustainability with our social workers and billable services in terms of case management? Often we'll see uh, reimbursement for clinical work, but not so much for the case management. How do we do that with um, the current structure that we have? If you are a primary care doc, uh, you can certainly set up some of those care coordination pieces, but it's further uh, exacerbated by the challenge we have because we have a mismatch of how we came together. So we're not a um, FQHC. Um, we don't have some of the normal structures under regulated environments. And so we're thinking through what that might look like. And that's one of the big challenges. The other piece of it is we get additional grant funding for our access grants for harm reduction but we don't have any ways to tie that into care coordination. I think that there's an opportunity here uh, for us to look at modeling that. Um, and so uh, it is essential that we think about this creatively. Uh, I think I saw a question. Yeah there's a, yeah, there's a couple of questions. And I wanna say, while you're looking at that, I think um, this is a great example of the uh, the improvement process over a long period of time it uh unfortunately doesn't answer the immediate person st sitting or standing in front of you however it's the gaps that help you drive the 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 building out the flushing out the and doing small tests of change like let's try this for three days or three weeks or all kinds of really great community performance improvement where everybody's seeing the same, everyone has similar, uh, I hate this phrase, but skin in the game, right? Like right. The, so these patients are seen in multiple places and right. how about we work together? Yeah. So there's a couple of questions um, in the yeah. chat. You could take what you like there. <laughs> Let me look at the... Oh, I'll read them to you. The first is, um, is this a primary care model or more of an urgent care model? It is a primary care model. And um, it's more of a primary care model. The integration of the, before I got there, folks thought about it in silos because the OTP is separate, the, um, the outpatient is separate. But the fact of the matter is the patients come through the OTP and they are identified as having need for primary care. And so that's, that's the model. The other piece, I think I saw a question about screening. Yeah. Uh, now working diligently, uh, we have in our EHR ethic uh, what's called the social determinants of health screen, um, but it's further challenged by how do we connect uh, community linkage. So I identify these needs, and that's part of our upper limit requirement. We have to have 50% of our folks who are coming through screen. And so that's, that's established, but we have to streamline this process a bit. And once we have screened them, now uh, as a part of the work and ongoing process, uh, we've identified a couple of resources to integrate into the next piece, which is community language. So clearly, if someone is identified in any primary care, you go right upstairs. Um, but we also want to make sure our community health workers are identifying that, notate, noting that in the, in the chart. And so we also want to make sure that when they identify these services to the community, for example, persons who are unhoused, uh, making sure that they can actually be connected. And we've had several of those, but uh, we have to get that somewhere into the linkage. And that's what we have done uh, for our work 
to ensure that folks are then being linked and then connected to housing or transportation and others. Uh, the literature. So the research is underway. Uh, Dr. Marik is one of the folks that we're working with uh, who's doing research on social determinants of health. Raw data collection is happening currently. There's another big study down there at University of Maryland College Park. We're looking at community linkage. It has not been published yet. I will say that um, part of my interest is we're now looking, uh, one of the books that were mentioned earlier uh, was the ASAM criteria. We're now looking at how we can connect in some of those service characteristics. As folks may or may not know, the ASAM criteria is what is used to uh, facilitate uh, quality services and or help with folks to manage how they structure their, their programs to meet the state requirements. I'm happy to say I'm one of the authors of that. And one of the areas that we're really interested in doing is making sure that we build out some of the pieces in terms of harm reduction, some of the pieces in terms of what is needed for individuals who require complex, severe um, responses in terms of treatment systems. And so we're hoping to design something in the future, the near future, around uh, why are folks with these complex needs not being linked or connected to the services? Uh, those are underway. Folks are interested in the fourth edition of the ASAM criteria. I'm happy to say that it was recently published. It's now available um, for those who are interested. That's great. And I think we have that reference in your sli the slides from um, a couple of weeks ago when you presented, right? I think okay. we did. Yeah. Uh, um, so um, a quick question. I'm going to put this question in the chat um, just as a way to wrap up. Tosin, could you repost uh, the links uh, in the chat um, to everyone? You sent it to me direct messaging. <laughs> so, so there. So in the chat, could everyone just write, like, it's the end of the year. It's always a good time to sort of step back and reflect, like, what ideally, in your ideal world, what would care of for people with chronic pain look like? What, what, what just money is no object. People are, you know, blue, what is that saying? Blue sky thinking, big sky thinking. What is it, blue sky? It's blue sky, right? Big, big picture thinking. What would, what would make that happen? Um, that would be really awesome uh, to hear what you're thinking about that. Just thinking about everything you've heard today, as well as everything we've talked about in the prior three sessions, which is all lots of really innovative um, different things. So go ahead and put that in the chat. And while you do that, uh, thank you, Tosin, for um, putting those in the um, the link. So please, uh, if you are, we invite everyone to complete the evaluation form. Um, really, we do. We value your input. It'll help us really get this, um, make sure that we're addressing what's interesting to you. Um, more touch points and patient-centered. Yeah, good. Um, next slide, please. While you all are putting that in there, um, we have the information about the um, CEs here. Uh, Margie, um, you have 72 hours to complete that evaluation form. So you have, uh, for the CEs, you have, oh, sorry, I said 72, it's 48 right there, 48 hours to complete the evaluation form, um, and you will receive it. Um, our next session, I can't believe it's already 2024, time is going way too fast. Uh, we will have, Dr. Berlin will be back, and he's going to be talking about tips and trips tips and tricks for non-opioid analgesics. And then um, remember last week we had uh, John Gasenica talking about the breakthrough research and, and that's leading, validating the pain reprocessing therapy. So one of his colleagues will be back talking about, uh, I just reviewed her slides this morning, um, really practical, pragmatic do's and don'ts, what to say, what not to say, how to educate patients, et cetera. So very exciting um, session. Uh, next slide, please. And Tosin, what would you like to say about this slide? 
Yes, thank you, Lynn. This is uh, a slide with a, a screenshot of the opioid and pain management best practice assessment results. We're encouraging all different types of facilities, whether if you're in a nursing home representative or a primary practice like we discussed today, go ahead and use the first link. It will take you directly to the opioid and pain management best practice assessment. And take some time, sit down. Um, it should take maybe about 20 minutes to really assess how your organization is addressing pain management. And once you save these results and submit them, you'll, we'll, you'll get some information and we can follow up and show you how your particular facility um, stacks up to other organizations throughout our IPRO region. So please go ahead and um, submit that. If you have any questions about that, feel free to um, reach out. But this is a great tool to really see how your organization is handling um, pain management based on clinical practice guidelines. Next slide. And these are some additional resources uh, from our last session. Orlando, uh, this book, uh, The Way Out, might be of interest um, as you're building out your core group of services um, in your organize, in your new position, um, just throwing, throwing it out there. Um, and I, I'm happy to send it to you uh, uh, email-wise too. Um, so we added those, those were from uh, John's presentation. Uh, the video he talked about with Howard, Dr. Howard Schubner. Um, Dr. Gooden, do you know Howard Schubner? Schubner? No? Oh, well, I think you would like each other. I think I think you you I'm gonna send you that link also. Uh, really fascinating, um, fascinating video. And uh, uh, Dan Berlin talked about that. Uh, really um, talked about his own experience with that. Is how incredibly positive it was for a patient who had lots of pain. Um, next slide. Right. And then these are just some additional books and resources. Uh, and Dr. Gooden, if you have anything that you would recommend people read. I, I, uh, Chosen, we are going to add that podcast about, um, uh, with Trevor Noah and Sam Altman about artificial intelligence and, um, thinking about the role of that in healthcare. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be a wild ride for your young people. <laughs> oh, next slide. And so thank you all for being here. Um, and yes, Rachel Softness, right? Uh, she's the best. I am a massive fan, fangirling all the way. Yeah, her workbook, her workbook for patients is really, really helpful. Um, just, just, it's worth a look anyways. Um, but a lot of the information is also on our website, but for patient resources, it's great. So thank you all. We hope you have a lovely holiday season, that you stay healthy, that those you love are healthy and those you don't love are healthy so that we're all staying healthy. Um, and um, we will look forward to seeing you in the new year uh, on January 10th. Thank you all so very much. And thank you uh, both to uh, Dr. Gooden and Dr. Wright for your presentation and your input today. Really thought provoking and inspiring all at the same time. <laughs>